Railway locomotives are powerful things. They need to be to move such heavy loads at high speeds. But even they need help from time to time, especially steam locomotives. In many cases, extra engines often had to push from behind in order to start heavy trains or to help them over gradients, requiring the railway expend additional manpower and resources. What steam locomotives needed was some kind of a booster that could provide extra traction when required. And so, that's what some engineers tried to install. Because most steam locomotives' driving wheels were directly connected to their cylinders, it essentially meant their gearing was fixed. This resulted in the locomotive's wheels determining much of their performance, as smaller driving wheels provided them with a higher tractive effort but lower overall top speed, and large driving wheels meant a lower overall tractive effort but a much higher top speed. Because faster engines had less tractive effort, they would often struggle to start trains or pull them over gradients, requiring additional engines to help. At lower speeds, a faster engine's boiler could produce more than enough power to climb hills and start trains, but the gearing of their wheels meant it was difficult to effectively use it. Eventually, some locomotive designers thought that if they added an additional, smaller set of driving wheels to an engine, separate from the main drivers, they could effectively use the available power in the boiler at lower speeds to provide more tractive effort. Once up to speed, these wheels would become unpowered so as to not wear out the cylinders and gearing. The first known example of an engine using this system was built in 1896 for the Royal Bavarian State Railway. Number 1400 was essentially a standard single driving design that was fitted with an additional, smaller set of driving wheels in front of the bigger, main drivers. These were connected to a piston that allowed them to be raised and lowered when additional traction was needed. I couldn't find much else on the engine, however it was reported to be very economical despite being more complex to maintain. After an accident in 1907, it was rebuilt into a standard 440 and continued to work until 1933. Another engine using a similar design was built for Bavaria in 1900 and named Dr. Von Klemm. This was a 642 design intended to pull express services, with the middle pair of leading wheels being powered by two smaller cylinders. Similar to 1400, these wheels could be raised and lowered when needed. It was displayed at the Paris World Exhibition in 1900 and garnered much attention, but little of its service history afterwards is known. It wouldn't be until 1919 when boosters would come into use again thanks to the Franklin locomotive boosters built in the United States, becoming a staple addition to many passenger and freight locomotives on the New York Central. Unlike the Bavarian boosters, the Franklin design involved mounting the boosters at the back of the locomotive, usually under the cab in place of the engine's trailing wheels. Faster engines needed unpowered wheels at the front and back to provide stability at higher speeds. But being unpowered essentially meant they wasted weight that they could otherwise use to improve traction, so it made sense to swap these out for powered wheels instead. These boosters were controlled by the engine's driver. When extra power was needed, all they'd do was pull a lever or turn a valve and the booster would kick in. Once the train was up to speed, the booster would then cut out. Despite the improvement in performance advertised by Franklin, the New York Central only fitted the boosters to a handful of their locomotives, including all of their Hudson Express engines. Other northeastern railroads followed suit, with the Pennsylvania, Chesapeake and Ohio, and the Norfolk and Southern fitting some of their engines with boosters too, though this was mostly to help improve performance on lines with hills and varying grades. Inspired by America, Victorian Railways of Australia had all but one of their X-Class goods engines fitted with boosters. South Australian Railways fitted their 500-class engines with boosters after being rebuilt, and the KB-class engines built for New Zealand Railways had boosters fitted to help them tackle the difficult grades on the mainland. The most noted use of these boosters was by Nigel Gresley for the LNER. Also taking inspiration from the American Franklin design, he initially experimented with them by fitting one to a C1 Atlantic in 1923, taking the place of the rear pony truck. The booster was found to be troublesome for footplate crews, but showed to be enough of an improvement for Gresley to pursue the design further. 
1925, he built the P1 class 282 Goods engines. Two were built, and both were fitted with boosters. The P1 experiment, however, wasn't a success. When in use, the boosters would end up filling the cab with steam, the steam pipes connecting the booster to the boiler were prone to breaking, and the boost in performance they provided was well in excess of the work they were doing. Most crews ended up hating both the P1s, and plans to build more were cancelled. Gresley didn't bother with boosters for another five years, until 1930, when he attempted to upgrade the Class S1 tank engines, formerly Class 8H of the Great Central Railway. These engines were built solely to push trucks over the steep hump at the Wathapon Dern Marshalling Yard in South Yorkshire. Despite their immense power, two were sometimes required to push in wet weather, and so Gresley felt that simply fitting boosters would help resolve the issue. Number 6171 was fitted with a booster and a superheater, but it was found to be more economical to build new engines rather than refit the older ones. And so two more S1s were built with the new equipment, while the rest were just fitted with superheaters. Most boosters were designed to only work in one direction, but because the S1s were shunting engines, their boosters were designed to work in both forward and reverse. About the same time, the C7 passenger engines working around Edinburgh, formerly Northeastern Railway Class Z, were having to doublehead their trains in order to tackle the grades of the line when travelling south. Seeing double heading as uneconomical, Gresley had numbers 727 and 2171 fitted with boosters to alleviate the problem. These boosters extended out from under the cab and connected to the tender, essentially turning them into tank engines. The change proved to be relatively successful, but many footplate crews who weren't used to using the boosters ended up either misusing them, damaging them, or just not using them at all. This leads us on to why boosters weren't more common on locomotives, despite them seeming to improve an engine's performance. Firstly was how awkward they were to operate. Drivers would need additional training to understand how and when to use a booster. If operated incorrectly, the booster could cause the boiler pressure to drop, significantly decreasing the engine's performance, or damage the booster itself. If the idler gear became damaged, the locomotive would be limited to the booster's top speed, usually somewhere between 20 to 25 miles an hour until it could be fixed. Most booster designs also couldn't operate in reverse, which was never a big issue, but did mean drivers had to be careful not to engage them while shunting, or risk possibly breaking them. Even the boosters fitted to the S1s, which were designed to work in both directions, were found to have trouble when used in reverse, leading to all of them having their booster reverse controls disabled. The cost of maintaining them was also an issue, as they added an additional set of cylinders, gears, and driving wheels that required servicing. Not to mention they required flexible pipes, which, historically, have always caused problems for steam locomotives. And even when they did work as intended, they added additional weight to the locomotive. So while they might significantly increase an engine's performance at lower speeds, at higher speeds, once the booster cuts out, they'd effectively become dead weight and decrease the engine's overall performance. And finally, many railways, especially the LNER, simply found building new, more powerful locomotives was more economical in the long run than using boosters. The modified C7s, for example. While the boosters did help them start trains and climb grades, the new A1s and A3s that were introduced around the same time could do the work on their own just fine, without the same cost and complexity. All eight of the engines fitted with boosters on the LNER had theirs removed by 1943, many having theirs disabled well before that. All in all, most boosters ended up being far more of a situational addition to a locomotive than a practical upgrade. While on paper they seem to alleviate one of the biggest weaknesses of high-speed steam, that being their lack of traction, in practice, they turned out to just be more trouble than they were worth. Let them be a reminder then that not everything slow needs a boost and that it's okay for some things to take a minute to get going. Subscribe for more.